This interview with bestselling author and host of the award-winning podcasts, e-commerce master plan and keep optimizing podcasts was very, very special to me. We started with the biggest challenges that she experienced in her business journey and a very deep insight, a very deep secret that makes all the difference in your marketing and sales, but also in your leadership and ultimately in your business success. And we ended up in a place that was very close to my heart and obviously very, very close to Chloe's heart. It's something that I think you will find exceptionally valuable for you, not only if you're an e-commerce entrepreneur, but regardless of the business that you are building right now, I think that these insights that we um, uncovered in this conversation are gonna be tremendously valuable for you, especially if you're looking to attract exceptional people in your business and also build a sustainable long-term business that gives you fun, freedom, and finance. So. Let's dive in and welcome to the power podcast. Chloe, tell us a bit about your journey. Like what inspired you to start your e-commerce business and what were you doing before? Well, I, I started my first business slightly by accident because the guy I worked for, um, I was head of e-commerce for a group of brands and he thought we could turn it into a marketing agency. So I became managing director of that and was was such for almost 10 years. So that wasn't really my my vision. It became my vision over the years. Um, but one of the things I learned whilst running that was that what I really wanted to do was to help e-commerce business owners work out how to how to avoid the waste of missed opportunities and doing the wrong marketing and not doing the right marketing and you know, all those things we don't know we don't know as well as the things we do know but don't realize we should be doing and all that kind of stuff and that trying to sell them google ad services at the same time is, can be seen as a bit of a conflict of interest so therefore i decided that the the solution to doing what i really wanted to do was to leave the agency or to to try and exit the agency and as part of that long exit plan i started e-commerce master plan initially with books and um kind of training courses and then over the years over almost 10 years now it's evolved to become kind of a podcasting and i suppose to some extent business influencer platform yeah that's that's exciting. You mentioned like the difference between, you know, bad marketing and good marketing. Like, what do you feel like where are most business owners failing in that sense, especially in the e-com space? Well, I think the, the challenge is always working out what you should be doing because there's an endless list of things you could be doing. I mean, I feel like every week I get told about a new platform that I should be advertising on, or I should be on or participating in. And it's the same for, you know, for any business. So the, the what is good marketing for one business is not gonna be good marketing for another. So the key thing is to work out where you're gonna put your time, effort, and money, and then optimize that. So just doing something for a week isn't good marketing either no. because it usually takes a few months to get it to work. Oh my God, you're crushing my boots. I thought it was going to be done in a week. Sorry. That's <laughs> 20 year old me. Still in a week, I'm going to be rich. It's going to be great. Awesome. If only. So I know you started in uh, your early, in the early 2000s. What was your biggest challenge you know, starting the business. I mean, it's never an easy journey, letting go of a job, letting go of perceived safety and security and just going into this entrepreneurial journey. Well, it wasn't, it's never felt like a risk to me. Um, I suppose the, the first business when I started the marketing agency, I was still on salary. We still had all the same clients. So that was just a yeah. change of um, who, who was, whose name was on the pay slip basically. Um, in terms of, of creating e-commerce master plan, I had, there was about a five year overlap between starting that and leaving the agency. So I still had the agency most of the time able to pay me. Um, and it gave me time to so basically five years to invest in the brand. So actually when I sold the marketing agency, the very first 12 months of being solo on e-commerce master plan was all about trying to work out if there was a business model there that made money because up until that point all the money it generated i plowed back into it 
in terms of growing the audience size, um, doing things better, building the brand, writing books, that sort of thing. So it was um, it was very in, it's been a very interesting journey over the last few years to discover that it can make money and how the best ways are for it to do that. Mm -hmm. And what was the biggest challenge in that sense? Like what if you had your younger self right now, what would you share with her? Um, I'd tell her to quit the agency faster because it was an energy sapping um, error. <laughs> It wasn't, it was, it was a good company, marvelous stuff. We had some lovely clients and I held on to it for too long because I wanted to do right by them and it destroyed me in the process. So I would tell her to, to understand herself sooner and therefore be able to play to her own strengths sooner. Let's dive deeper into that. I mean, um, a big part of my work is um, allowing people to see themselves clearly not better, not worse than they are, and to really see their strengths and weaknesses. When you say understand yourself better, what's that imply to you? Well, the understanding I eventually have reached, which I'm still on the journey, as I think we probably all are always, but I am quite a long way down the introvert scale, like a really long way down the introvert scale. So running a marketing agency I mean, I used to call it my people energy, but now I have a better understanding that it's just things that are a bit chaotic or mm -hmm. change, which humans are very, very good at developing that in, just as they walk around a room. And so when you're running an agency, you are in charge of looking after the staff, um, the new business pipeline and the existing clients. And that would exhaust me. So I'd spend evenings and weekends on my own because it was the only way I could still be able to function at work. And <laughs> at least one of the team referred to me as a mood hoover quite a lot of the time when I was in the office. So what's a mood hoover? A mood hoover is um, I would often be in such a foul mood, which I refer to, I refer to now as my hedgehog mode, um, but I was in such a foul mood, it would just permeate the office and everyone was scared to move. Um, so yeah, it, because I was essentially on the fast track to burnout, because I was doing all these things that didn't really, they kind of played to my skill set, but they didn't play to my strengths. And I was yeah. just exhausting myself. And then I say hedgehog mode because, you know, you, when you're under attack enough, not that anyone's trying to attack you, but you feel under attack enough, I, I ball up into a hedgehog and the spikes are me being angry and an asshole, <laughs> basically. Nowadays, I recognize it and I go and hide somewhere. Um, but, you know, that was how it was back then. And if I'd understood all that about myself, I could have and would have found my route to a business where I could I could do better for for the world you know for, for you know just give more whilst not destroying myself in the process yeah i mean that's so important um to you know and i kind of know what you're talking about because i'm also an introvert and you know for people listening who don't know extroverts build up energy in themselves when connecting with other people and being surrounded by people whereas to us it's exceptionally draining to be around people like you know you're an introvert when you can speak on stage in front of thousands of people but you're scared of having a conversation with the five people that you're going to talk to after the speech right yeah so yeah i know i know what you're talking about and uh for me like when i was back when i was teaching the personal development for martial arts i built this persona of this i'm this martial arts guy but what i was really was this sensitive person that was you know trying to protect himself from the world but yeah it takes a lot of guts and it's absolutely a process for you to mm -hmm. like for everybody to understand hey it's not that it, it that i need to respect myself like the whole world needs me to respect myself and take care of myself first yeah and you can't respect yourself until you understand who you actually should be you know, I look back and I got all the stuff I've done over the years when I thought I was being true to myself, but actually I was true, being true to the, the vision I had in my head of what other people and other and society thought I should be. And it's, um, you, can, you, I, you know, I've, I, I won't say I've wasted, uh, you know, a couple of decades no, going down no that way. path because they weren't a waste, no but way, no. 
it's I do sometimes look back and go wow if I'd only known this then how would things have turned out differently but I love where I'm at you know and I, I don't really have any regrets but it's it, it's something I really wish I got into sooner yeah it's like you know in martial arts it was like your biggest weakness becomes your biggest strength um not understanding yourself for years actually you know it's it's like you go deep into the yin, the yin actually grows the yang. So the more time you spend not being who you are, the more authentic you are once you kind of let go of that thing that, you know, oh, you have to be this person and this person for people to like you or to make sales, right? right. Yeah, it's like I can, I can go and do a conference incredibly well for about a day now since since uh, since the, the pandemic and not seeing many people my ability to do a conference has definitely declined but you know I can go and I can I can appear like an extrovert for for a good day and you know yeah. make all the connections do all the networking thoroughly enjoy myself but by about 7 p.m I'm going to need to go and hide <laughs> somewhere in a hotel room <laughs> somewhere because otherwise the hedgehog's going to come out. So, you know, I'll be in the hotel with my room service watching Netflix and I'll be perfectly happy and I've had a lovely day and it might take a couple of days to fully recover, but, but it will have been brilliant. But it, had I known all this when I was, I don't know, 15, I wouldn't be able to do that because I wouldn't have made myself do it whilst imagining I was being the right person, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's powerful yeah yeah and would you say that that was like your biggest challenge in hindsight like knowing yourself and kind of taking actions that are more aligned with your true self or was there something else I think that's looking back that's been the thing which I think I've achieved the most around and life mm -hmm. is an awful lot more fun on every front um, yeah. Now I've done that. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the big one, the big one. Yeah. But it kind of, there's so many other bits come into it, you know, and there's been so many other mistakes along the way, but that is the, the big core piece, which has made the difference. And do you see that helping, um, you know, entrepreneurs? I know your market is um, e-commerce entrepreneurs. Is that an insight that, like all entrepreneurs should be aware of or because I see like the the topic that we're uncovering right now coaches are like oh my god this is so great this is exactly how I feel this right what do you what do you think about sharing this with like every entrepreneur or you know would they see the value in that I think yes because if you if you are an entrepreneur you're dealing with other people so whether you are the biggest extrovert in the room you know, and if you have to spend an hour on your own, you are climbing the walls trying to find some other person or some other chaos to go and excite you and get your energy going. Um, or whether you are, you know, like me and like you and definitely on the introvert side of the scale, unless you understand the differences in those two personality types, yeah. you can't construct um, an event or talk to and understand and empathize with other people. And, you know, the the key thing I've learned time and time again throughout business is that it's the the empathy you have with other people the ability to connect with other people which is crucial whether like you or I we are a podcast host quickly having to get to know someone to create 30 minutes of awesome content or whether we're someone running an agency who's having to to learn enough about a client to be able to pitch the right services to make you know to pay it pay the bills it's if you if you have this this kind of like introvert extrovert grasp and understand who the people are then you know who you're inviting to the right things and what subjects you're bringing up and it's it's just another very simple way of of understanding humans better which can only be good in a business context and a life context quite frankly yeah for sure and it's also it's also true that the more you know yourself the easier it is to know other people and kind of you know intuitively feel people you know like from the first impression um and that's something that i also wanted to get into with you in one of your episodes uh describing how you run your podcast you mentioned how to hire really really good people and you shared a few resources you know like hiring from your fan base upwork you know virtual mm -hmm. staff founder linkedin so on and so forth but what i wanted to know and maybe dive a bit deeper because 
you know, most entrepreneurs are like, oh, you cannot find good people to hire anymore. You know, people are lazy. You know, I don't have a budget to hire exceptional people, so on and so forth. How do you filter out the people who maybe look good on paper, but are probably not going to be a good fit? When I've done it with, actually, this is kind of one theory I bring to both hiring full-time employees, which I did a lot when we were running the marketing agency, as well as hiring freelancers. Freelancers who you'll probably never meet in person if you're taking advantage of the global economy we, we now exist in, um, is to set them tasks related to what you're doing. So when we had the marketing agency, or when I had the marketing agency, we were mainly doing Google ads and Facebook ads. Now, you, there's no point in hiring someone if they can't look at a spreadsheet you know, a row of campaigns. And, and when you say to them, which campaign do you think is the best? They can't tell you which one they think is the best and why they think it's the best. And then when oh. you say, if I gave you an, an hour to improve performance, which of these campaigns would you work on? And all they've got is the numbers, nothing else. You know, if they can't do that, they ain't getting hired. Oh, I like this one. It has a really nice name to it. Yeah, Sounds exactly. So exciting. We had some um, some phenomenal answers to that over the years because we would we would do the hiring process and have different members of the team get everyone in who are going to hire on the same afternoon, all in a room, present to them about the role and about the business, see if they had any questions, and then send them off into different rooms for different types of interview with different people. So from the lowest person in the company up to me. Right. You know, someone would be asking the probably a manager level person would be asking the test questions. One of the juniors would probably be asking something about their life and their interests and their aspirations. And I'd probably be doing more of the technical stuff. We have a number of stations they work around for half an hour and then everybody scores them independently. So you get that full impression around the business. And then you've got a really clear idea of, of who you want to bring in. But when it comes to, to testing freelancers, you know, so using Upwork or any of those platforms, I tend to, um, I pay them for the testing usually. So we just hired someone to write the show notes, which is the blog post that goes along each pod alongside each podcast episode. So I put the job on Upwork for one show notes, just one of them, asked them to pitch their price, gave them the MP3 to listen to. I think I had about seven or eight people. I usually mm -hmm. aim for more than five less than 10, but it depends on what the quality of the applications are. See how easy they are to work with. You know, I don't want someone who's going to come back and ask me 20 questions, including where's the MP3? It's like, I've already sent it to you. <laughs> you know, that's an immediate, you're not getting hired <laughs> if you can't understand instructions because you're both testing the way they work and yeah. the quality of the work. Then you get the work back and then you can quite quickly see who gets it, who understands it. And then you hire that person to do you know to do more or you do a second round if you're not sure you know so it's testing is essential and when it comes to you know something like that I will pay each of them there what they say they want to be paid for that yeah. first show notes because a lot of these people they are working really hard to try and you know get their algorithm working on Upwork and all the rest of it and I don't expect them to work for me for free when they're freelancers and that is so great and such a powerful investment because hiring the wrong person will always cost you money and time. Oh, yeah. My biggest mistake ever <laughs> was hiring the wrong person, <laughs> holding on to them for too long, being convinced it was not it was me and not them. Then having to run a redundancy process to get rid of them where I had to use lawyers and uh, managing to hold on to them about one week past the point at which the recruitment agency would have given me back their fee. So all in all, I was down about £30,000. So, um, yeah, yeah, it pays to spend time and money on the recruitment process. <laughs> oh, and the other thing is, of course, I didn't give all seven, eight of them the same MP3 to turn into show notes. I gave them all different ones because then I get seven sets of show notes written during the testing process. Well, actually, three of them were total garbage. So I got about four written, but oh. you, know, you don't have to give them all the same one. Definitely a pro tip. <laughs> awesome. Um, you also mentioned that, like in the beginning, it was this is more a question for me. Um, you mentioned that in the beginning, it was super hard for you to find good guests for the podcast, for the show, right? Um, and then now you're like, okay, I'm, I have too many guests. I have to filter them out, right? Um, what makes a great guest for you? 
Oh, that's a tough one. And yes, guests is, I think guests will always be a problem of some description because they make or break your podcast. So it, it's, it's tricky. Um, well, we have the two different, the two, two podcasts. So each of them has a different perfect guest. E-commerce master plan, it's someone who works in a senior position at a e-commerce business. So they're selling on Shopify or Magento or Big Commerce or something like that. Um, and they're selling uh, these days because we're doing more of a sustainability focus now, more of a net zero focus. They've got to be on the journey to doing better for the planet, uh, mm, which covers which I like that. Yeah, I like that a lot. Which covers having been researching this for a while, it it covers an awful lot of businesses, far more than you would think. So we're often, uh, you know, getting into how you tell people that you're doing good for the planet because not many businesses are good at doing that. Um, so they're, they're doing that and they've probably got some interesting growth angle or marketing angle. So we used to be a business that's growing in an interesting way. Could be a startup, could be something, um, you know, huge. Nowadays, it's they're growing and they're respecting the planet and the people as much as they're respecting the profits. And then on, on keep optimizing, sorry, I'll let you. People, profits, and planet. Mm. It's like a, that. it's a proper business strategy that I keep forgetting the name of, but if you Google it, you'll find it. It's on Harvard Business Review and everything. It's a proper account, you know, serious business strategy, people, planet, and profits. Um, and then for keep optimizing, we have marketing experts on. And we organize our episodes into months on specific topics. So there, my perfect guest is someone who is up for sharing an angle of whatever marketing method we're covering. So if we're doing Facebook ads, they don't want to cover everything about Facebook ads. They want to cover um, the right campaign types to run at the moment, or they want to cover Facebook shops, or they want to cover messenger ads, or they want to cover getting the video right, or, you know, a key angle on it and who are very, very good at it. And mm. ideally will promote it as well. Um, so we, lo we love people who share. So we're reaching the point where we're getting repetitive guests now and keep optimizing, which is excellent because I know they get it and I know they're going to turn up and give loads of value. So yeah, that's, it's different for each show um, and it evolves, but that's the basics. I love that. I love that. Um, yeah. And some good things for myself to think about and to consider. Maybe I could focus a lot more on entrepreneurs who are doing something powerful for the planet and feature them, right? Because that's definitely something that I'm passionate about as well. Um, cool. What gets you fired up these days? Not just about business, you know. At the moment, I am very fired up about sustainability in the planet, having... Um... Having attended a climate conference a couple of uh, about a month ago and gone into utter fear for about 24 hours, because um, it's an area I've been really interested in, but I haven't really got done proper research into. So I went, right, I'm going to attend this, this event um, and got properly freaked out by the numbers for about, about 24 hours and then bought a lot of books on the subject and slowly clawed myself out of the, oh my gosh, chicken little sky's falling type thing into, there's a huge potential for people I've already spoken to before I, I did this, who are doing clever things and who are changing things. So I'm, I'm just at the beginning of the journey. I'm hoping to inspire our listeners to go on as well, which is how can e-commerce and retail become a force for good in the climate crisis? Because you know, the fashion industry in particular is one of the worst industries when it comes to, um, to the climate. But there are clever things being done, but all of this retail piece is not going to help the planet unless we can also start changing the way consumers purchase. Mm. Disposable products, disposable clothing is no longer what we need to be doing. We need to be selling better quality gift goods that consumers will buy less of, which is... A bit mad, <laughs> but that's what I'm what I'm very excited about at the moment is is how to frame all of that up and how to help businesses do it. But I think like a big part of that is, you know, is your work essentially because um, education plays a huge role. I mean, we have a saying here in Romania, I'm too poor, I'm too poor to buy something cheap. 
I get that. You go for right. the you've got to got to go for the investment piece, not you go you go for the I don't know the 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 in, I want to say plow or spade or something because I feel like I need to take this back to farming. Mm-hmm. But you know, so you no. buy the the right one, not the short term solution. No, it basically means like instead of buying a cheap pair of shoes that I have to replace in a few months, um, it's better to buy the more expensive ones that I can wear for years. Right. Not everybody yeah. embraces this idea because, you know, consumerism is definitely part of our culture um, increasingly more, unfortunately, maybe, you know, um, hopefully it's going to change, probably it's going to change. Um, but yeah, like having knowing that, OK, I'm just going to pay a bit more for this sweater or maybe double or triple, but it's going to last me like seven times more than than you know buying the cheap one and i know it's come from a company who are using uh, the leftover fabric from a from someone else's manufacturing process or it's coming from one of the really clever new textiles which are coming out all over the place which are you know maybe reusing plastic bottles or they're uh, based on um on organic materials which are considerably kinder to the planet than cotton which you feel like cotton should be the answer, but cotton almost certainly isn't the answer. It's, it, it, and it all gets very confusing as you go through it, which is why I think there's, as well as the e-commerce businesses themselves that I talk to becoming more net, uh, you know, net zero um, targeting or heading further along that journey, there's also a huge role that we all have to play in educating the consumer to buy better. Um, and I also think that there's a huge market for uh, sustainable consumerism, let's say like huge it's like all the um all the best situations i find in business often if there's something we should be doing there's usually a big fat pot of cash at the end of the rainbow you know and the there is you know we've seen the veganism um uplift and people wanting more vegan products we see people now wanting to check a business is sustainable before they buy from them or that or actively searching for sustainability policies it's something which one of the things which the pandemic has accelerated i think we're we're all feeling that but we're seeing it in where the money is being spent in the e-commerce space there's a huge opportunity there there's also if you if you look at um the clothing space had an amazing guest on Camilla Olson from um, from the US, who did uh, a postgraduate diploma in in um, I think New York Fashion School. If I may have made that up, sorry if I made that one up. But she 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 decided to go and, and do this piece and became a fashion designer um, in her later life. But it, she had a big background in AI and um, analysis and data, and worked out that the majority of women in the world have a body shape that is not catered to by the main fashion retailers. So if you want to look at the waste there is in just the fashion economy, it's because the clothes you see on the high street or in the malls, most of them have not been designed to fit you. So you buy them, you get them home and you're like, oh, this doesn't really fit. You wear it twice, you don't like it. It it doesn't cover what you want it to cover or whatever else. And you give yeah. up on it and then you wear a sack for the next two years until you can. But it, but the, the financial opportunity of creating clothes to f- actually fit people is billions. And it's like that's a form of sustainability is actually creating clothes that people want to wear so they don't throw them away or, you know, just endlessly buy them and store them in the cupboard. So there's there's all these pots of cash and opportunity for the businesses who are heading down this route. And more and more, we are going to see consumers only buying from those companies who are doing it. I love that. I love that. And that's such a smart way of going about it. Yeah. Yeah. And I was thinking like when you when you were describing that, I was thinking about my girlfriend. That's exactly what happens. Like she buys something and then, you know, she wears it for a bit and they're like, oh, mm, don't like it as much. Let me buy something else. Right. Yeah, for yeah, sure. We're, I think we're all guilty of it because we also even those of us who who some of the clothes do fit, we still buy the clothes that don't. I mean, right now I am wearing a pink um kind of cardigan which looks good from here up but from here down looks awful but it's been sitting in the cupboard for a year because I shouldn't have bought it but then I thought I could wear it on zoom (laughs) and I'll get some use out of it that would be a good sustainability measure you know one cardigan at a time but it you know it's 
it's about buying more 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 sensibly but it's also then using what we've got and not not just throwing it out and not just um you know replacing it, which all starts from buying properly in the first place and i also think it has a a, a lot a lot to do with this inherent feeling that you know all of us have of not being enough and associating buying more shit just to kind of you know silence that voice and say hey no like i look good today shut up right i am enough it's like yeah if if you're you know i i recently changed my definition of success to me it was when i get there i'm gonna feel something mm -hmm. right whereas now i understand that true success is being happy and fulfilled no matter what happens around you yeah that was it, it's been one of my aims with e-commerce master plan i said the first year i was doing it solely on my own was can it make money but the other part of that was can it make money and i'm as you know year two sorry was can it make money and i can be happy yeah. you know so if it had been i've the only way it can make money is by me spending a lot of time with people it would have been back to the drawing board how do we restructure this and rebuild it and it's you know the kind of i guess over the last maybe five years i've been trying to work out how can i both be successful in business and happy at home and i i don't think i've nailed it yet we're still a little bit like this but um you know it's a lot better than it used to be was like this yeah so it, you know but it, it's we we're also on the podcast now trying to talk less about growth and more about success because i think to, to suggest that every e-commerce business needs to be growing or every business needs to be growing at an exponential rate is wrong um what it actually should be is what does success look like for this business yeah. or for this business owner and for the people in this business. And that may not be to double every year, um, but that all comes back to working out what you actually want in the first place, which is often quite hard to do. Yeah. And that takes like some deep questions and, you know, stepping into some uncomfortable spaces that, mm. you know, you might be running from for a while. Right. But, you know, pain is the, biggest teacher you know you, you achieve everything you ever wanted and then you're like okay still not happy what am i going to do mm. right and then you're like okay my definition was wrong of what i actually wanted where i what i wanted was like the feeling of being enough and feeling happy and 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 you know balanced but what most of us don't realize including myself like for most of my life you have access to that right now right you can't, yeah. it's like one of my clients said, you're chasing the dragon, but you never catch it. Of course, because the dragon you're chasing is already in you. How can you catch it? Right? So my belief is like when you, when you reach that point and life becomes a lot more playful, a lot more of a game, there's no more obligation. You get to do stuff. Yeah, it's one of the things I battle with currently is I see opportunities, you know. So we did a virtual summit last year that went really well. And I'm like, oh, we should do two virtual summits in 2022 then. And it's like, then you kind of go, but actually, do we need to do for two virtual summits? Is it really going to benefit the audience if I do more than one virtual summit? Or should I just put Rather than, rather than doubling the effort I put in, should I just put 50% extra effort into making the one virtual summit really, really good and just enjoy the fact I don't have to run two launches next year? And it's, you know, five years ago, I'd have gone, no, we'll do two, we need to do two virtual summits. There's, there's money to be made. And it's like, actually, is it, is there a value in two virtual summits? When, when literally in the e-commerce space, there seems to be at least two virtual summits happening a week. So, how do you yeah it, it it's but it's difficult to say no to things when they could be good on one metric but then you have to go actually let's look at the whole picture does this actually line up yeah yeah i play this game with my clients <clears throat> i tell them look there's one secret word in the english language that will give you all the freedom in the world do you want to do you want to hear it and they say yes okay take out a piece of paper and your pen okay great you ready yes Okay, type in the letter N. Okay, N. And then type in the letter or write down the letter O. And they're like, what? 
but it's so true it is if you can just yeah. work out how to say no um i've built so many ways to say no into the business now it's um because yeah. I, I still find it really really hard just to say no so i have lots of ways of saying no that aren't quite no you know like we're not focusing on, on that this quarter feel free to get back to us next year or you know with you mentioned the guests we now we do use it it's not a bin where we just send people who want to be guests and never look at them again but we now have a web page that details what we're looking for and with application forms yeah. and you know we we send almost everybody gets sent there apart from you know when we get i don't know a yoga instructor or a or someone who designs airplanes wanting to be on i'm just like no sorry <laughs> it's just really really <laughs> never gonna happen i'm not gonna make you fill in the form but you know everyone else gets put in the form because that's where i start every hunt for guests but it otherwise it becomes a management otherwise you know otherwise i'm just saying no because of my ex i feel like they want to be on the show this week and i'm like ah, so i send them to the form but you've got to find those different ways to say no yeah for sure i think it comes back to you know what you mentioned in the beginning just knowing yourself and then once you know yourself accepting yourself the good the bad the ugly right and um then falling in love with all of that shit right mm -hmm. and then that makes it a lot more easier to say hey meh, the, nah i don't really want to do this and then say yeah but i think it, it's one of the really fascinating um individual impacts of the pandemic is that we with various lockdowns and um, inability to travel and all the rest of it we all ended up accident not through our own volition saying no to a lot of things and life became a lot simpler and a lot smaller and i've been very conscious since theoretically lockdown ended here in the uk to work out what i'm now going to say yes to and not just go back to default a you know create a new default that works better and that is really hard to do <laughs> it's really hard to do even when you're thinking you need to do that you know and I've spoken to people who've just become lost because they they just went back to what they were doing before and it just doesn't no longer they realize now that that's not necessarily what they wanted or needed yeah yeah you're still chasing the dragon hmm. right oh I have to be something else someone else or otherwise I'm not gonna get the thing yeah for sure yeah I mean you know, this is what I was thinking when you were describing the, the planet. Um, I think, you know, a lot of our principles as human also as humans also apply to the collective. I think, you know, your biggest weakness becomes your biggest strength. And I think we're starting to be become aware of this huge weakness of consumerism. And I'm very optimistic about it because, you know, more and more conversations are uh, being had around it. So that's super powerful. And it was the same with the pandemic. I mean, for me, I lived in the capital of Romania, like in Bucharest, super crowded, you know, busy city. And I lived there for six years. And through the pandemic, um, myself and my, me and my girlfriend went to our parents' houses. And it was like fresh air, gardens, you know, we didn't have any more fights anymore. And it was like, in Bucharest, it was one fight a week. And we realized, you know what, the, th this big city life isn't for us. That's not who we are. And we moved to another city close to the mountains. You know, it's, we have nature. I have, you know, I see a field, I see houses, I see mountains. Totally changed my life. So grateful for, for it, you know. And I, I think a lot of people went through a transformation like this thanks to the, the, the pandemic. Yeah, I think it kind of pressed pause on everyone and gave us the chance to reassess who we are and what we actually want because so much was stripped away um it's i think we'll be looking back and referencing it and calling it fascinating for for a good decade yet yet to come um yeah it's been it's been an interesting couple of years yeah yeah for sure for sure this was an interesting turn right from the uh start of the <laughs> conversation <laughs> a good 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 interesting turn if not more than one interesting turn though i think yeah yeah for sure um this this was really really fun and uh i'm very happy that you accepted my invitation you're officially the first guest to uh in the podcast so really really appreciate that um 
what would you like uh where would you like people to find you get in touch with you um maybe uh get one of your books yeah. your early books cool well um there are both early books and more recent books there we go. Uh, and thank you so much for inviting me on it's a pleasure to be here and i hope we've inspired a few people with our conversation mm -hmm. and helped a few people too uh anyone who wants to to find me get in contact find about the podcast or any of those sorts of things you just head to ecommercemasterplan.com you'll find everything i'm up to um by the time this is live, you should be able to find a page that details our journey to net zero, which, as I said, it's a journey and I have none of the answers, um, <laughs> but it's it's the right thing to be doing. But you'll find all of that stuff at ecommercemasterplan.com. I love that. I love that. And uh, I love your positioning because most experts, you know, it comes from like, oh, I have the answers. Nobody fucking has the answers. Yeah. It's, it's, quite okay. a, it's quite a fun one for me because usually I'd be like, right, in six months, I'm going to read every book, uh, listen to every podcast, become an expert, have a massive list of stats, and then in six months' time, we'll do it. And um, I'm, I, I'm going, no, it's a journey. I don't have to have the answers. I'll bring on people who've got answers. And um, we, we need to inspire people. We need to inspire people now. I was attended a, a, a kind of like a webinar training session on your, your journey to net zero yesterday. And one of the things they were saying was that normally when you do a project, you measure everything to see what level of difference you need to make. You know, like you measure how much energy you're using and you measure how much waste you're producing. But actually that just delays your impact. So what the first step is actually do the obvious stuff, you know, recycle more, use less plastic, change your energy supplier and whatever else it may be. Once you've done the obvious stuff, then start measuring. Mm. which is so counter to everything we normally do in marketing and business, but it's completely the right thing to do because time is of the essence in this particular scenario. Well, you know why that makes a lot of sense to me? Um, I'm using this app on my phone. They help me tremendously with my fitness, right? And I get like this uh, uh, personal trainer and, you know, they personalize my, uh, you know, my workouts. And I had a call with him and I asked him about nutrition. And he sent me this uh, personalized meal plan. And in the meal plan, it was, I really loved the approach. And they said, don't focus too much on, on measuring everything. Just start to play around with it first and just start to be aware of it. Just have, it, have the guide in, in your kitchen, right? So they were encouraging me to take imperfect action and be fine with not, you know, doing it perfectly from mm -hmm. the start. And what that allowed me to do since I used it, I mean, I started using it yesterday. I was, or the day before, I wasn't completely on track, but I didn't blame myself and didn't judge myself. I said, okay, great. This is part of the process. So to me, what, what you're sharing right now makes a lot of sense. Just start with something, right? And then yeah. you're going to become this big expert in sustainability and, you know, have all the numbers and so on and so forth. Hmm exactly you've just got to start and you know such a big part of the start is is in, or part of the process is inspiring other people you know and challenging your own suppliers and all that kind of stuff that unless you start having the conversation nothing happens yeah yeah beautiful loved it thank you so much and uh maybe uh we'll get a chance to have another chat like this soon to update me on what's happening in your world in terms of sustainability and inspiring more entrepreneurs to think that way. But it's been an absolute pleasure. And I wish you all the best with this podcast. Um, I think if, if the rest of the conversation is anything like ours, it's going to be a going to be a blast. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Thank you too. This was fun, right? Thank you so much for tuning in and absolutely give us a review, a rating, wherever you listen to your podcast, whatever service you use to get your podcasts. Tell us what you think. Give us a rating. It's going to help us tremendously. And if you are an entrepreneur looking to boost sales, improve your marketing, but also build a business of true freedom and true success without overwhelm, without overwork, absolutely check out my app, my mobile app. It's called the Power Become Happy and Wealthy app, and you can find it on the App Store and on Google Play. Thank you so much, and I will see you soon.